This is the Roman Catholic convent of the poor Clares in Arundel. Here, 21 nuns live in prayer and contemplation. Their way of life has remained largely unchanged for hundreds of years, until now. One bohemian atheist, Bollocks, piss off. A disillusioned workaholic, a mother of three who is terrified of God. Couldn't he do it in a less scary way? And a soul singing reformed alcoholic are moving in. All at crisis point, they are leaving behind everything they know and love to spend 40 days and 40 nights on a quest to find meaning in their lives. But not even the nuns could expect the road to salvation to be quite so rocky. They were behaving a little bit like bolshy teenagers. I think it is actually a form of abuse. Yes, I won't work with it. It's a bit like Catholic boot camp. No matter how hard they fight against it. I really do think it's going to help me a lot if I can just get over my fear of things, which I'm really working on. This journey could ultimately change their lives forever. God, what am I going to do when it comes time to go? At the convent, the nuns are busy preparing for their guests' arrival. They've never had people to stay before, not in 700 years, so everyone is a little nervous. Well, it's a relief that the day's finally come, but I think we feel quite apprehensive. We're, we're creatures of habit. Routine is something good for us. And so the break-in routine, although we're going to try and keep the routine, this will be a break in it. So, that, I suspect, won't be quite as easy as we'd like it to be. <laughs> Their first guest is also a creature of habit, mostly bad habits. At 25, soul singer Iona is desperate to be saintly, working in an industry full of sin. Commitments are kind of within quite kind of a coarse world, I suppose, where it's kind of a lot of drugs and a lot of drink and a lot of hedonism. My world kind of changed hugely when I when I gave up drinking because it was I was completely in the mid kind of, of everything, in the midst of everything, kind of the whole kind of everyone doing coke in the studio and me kind of saying no thanks, but you know I'm cool with you guys doing whatever. And for me, I, I'm trying to kind of keep kind of foot in each, each camp, you know, and it's quite difficult to do that. Still a virgin. Iona's issues center on sex. She's an evangelical Christian and believes God has told her to live her life as a celibate, a calling she's hoping the nuns can help her understand. Guest number two doesn't have such worries. As she doesn't believe in God at all. My wild woman makes love with every inch of her body. Just the sight of her toes would make a grown man beg. Victoria is 34, a free-thinking poet who lives with her husband Adam in an open marriage. I do feel strong emotions for other people sometimes that I have fallen badly in love with other people and it's caused a lot of pain sometimes. Her current infatuation is Simon. There's always been a tension between whether we're together as a couple, whether we separate or, you know, every year it kind of comes up and it kind of churns up within our relationship. So. Maybe this will give Vic some ideas about, you know, whether we, uh, whether we're going to stay together, whether we're going to split up, but, you know, because it seems to change with the seasons. Life without rules has left Victoria unsettled. She hopes that living in a strict convent regime might allow her to reassess her boundaries. But for a woman who has never got up to an alarm clock, it won't be easy. There is no element of the poor Claire's lives that is without the rigor of discipline. Living to bells, their lives follow a rigid schedule. Up at 5 a.m. for morning prayer, the first of seven prayer sessions a day, seven days a week. Even domestic chores must be done in silence because they believe it brings them closer to God. The three vows we take, poverty, chastity, and obedience, if you like, 
that's our way of giving up and turning away from what people in the world hold dear. It's to live a very simple life of prayer and contemplation and community. I mean, that really is our life. It, simplicity is the hallmark and poverty in that sense of not having anything more than you really need. The third woman joining the convent doesn't do poverty. Angela is 43. She's a shrewd, sharp and successful businesswoman who revels in a thrusting male environment and admits to being uncomfortable in female company. But all that is about to change. She's turning her back on a six-figure salary to live in the all-female and frugal poor Claire life. Uh, everything's at stake for me at the moment because I have had to give up my job to go into the convent. I'm also obviously giving up my friends, my family, my home, my way of life. Um, everything that, that I do actually at the moment is fun. Having spent most of her life as a slave to her work, Angela has acquired two houses, one here and one in Tuscany. But it's left her feeling empty. She hopes the nuns will help her overcome her fear of failure and gain fulfillment at a deep and less materialistic level. The last woman joining the convent is possibly the bravest of them all, because she's terrified of God. 44-year-old Debbie is a children's entertainer. Abandoned by her mother as a child, she can't shake off the belief that God is punishing her. All of a sudden, Flynn spun around. The dragon had landed on the ground. I remember when I was at school, there was a, a puppet show. And for one day, I forgot all my problems. I forgot how bad life was. And I don't know if there might be another child out there that might be having a horrendous life. And if I can make them escape from that for one day, that makes me feel good inside. It's, it's like a cathartic sort of process, really, in that way. Now a mother herself, she's hoping that the nuns will help her see religion in a new light. but it's a high-risk strategy. In order to come to terms with her past, Debbie is leaving behind her five-year-old son for 40 days. So for her, it had better work. <laughs> Over the next six weeks, the four women will try and find a spiritual path. And for the nuns, this BBC experiment is a rare opportunity to explain their calling. I think perhaps it says there's a certain missionary aspect to it. In a sense, you've come to us so that you can take us out. You can show us to other people. And in a way, that's our main aim, is to sort of just be ourselves here and somehow relate that the values we find here to other people. Now oh, that's them, that's the doorbell. The nuns know nothing about their guests. <laughs> this is the first time they have ever allowed outsiders in. Hello. Hi, I'm Angela. To live amongst them. There's a lot at stake for all concerned. Live. You're welcome. <laughs> and everyone is hoping the gamble will pay off. It's the first morning, and convent life starts early. A little too early for atheist Victoria. It's quarter past five. 
Okay, for a lot of people that wouldn't actually seem that early because I have to have to get up morning. But I only got to sleep at about three because so I was tossing and turning. And hoots I look like this. Um, but I thought I'd share it with you. My first morning of getting up to an alarm. The first service is at 5.45. The nuns are meant to be silent from dusk till dawn, so that the first words they utter on waking are directly to God. Let us rejoice in the Lord. With songs, let us praise him. Let us rejoice in the Lord. With songs, let us The four women are expected to try and observe this rule. Hail the God who saves us. The nuns hope that by adapting to their routine, the women will find a relationship with God, or at least get to know themselves better. The Ten Commandments are first promulgated by Moses on the mountain. As well as seven services a day, the women will also take daily religious instruction to help them understand where the nuns are coming from. See, they're Jewish, first of all. Mm. Jesus was a Jew. The first session is with Jewish. Sister Claire Agnes. But what was meant to be a gentle introduction to the words of God soon becomes all too personal for two of the women in the group. He said, um, love one another, not as you love yourself, but as I have loved you. So that kind of overturns all the others, that if you do love one another, then you don't check out the other's wife, then you don't... That's go and right. steal from, from this person, then you don't, um, yeah. They're all manifestations. Of love of neighbour are all in the Ten Commandments. Then God spoke all these words. He said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. This is the whole business of the covenant. I've saved you. You shall have no gods except me. And of course, modern gods are two cars. A house in uh, Italy. What about, what about other fates, though? I've been singled out. I'll have your house in Italy. That will make me happier than you are. No, I don't, I don't think I don't feel like that's a house here. I don't think that's what a modern god is. I think a modern god is chasing after, always chasing after something. Um, well, people do a lot to chase after having two cars. I don't think I worship money. Getting back to what you were saying. I don't think you worship money, that wasn't what I was saying. Just because you want a house in Tuscany. I'm sorry. Just because you have a house in Tuscany. I want a house in Tuscany. Just bring it on. You have to put everything in context. I mean, I'm single, yeah. I have to work to house myself. I don't live in a very big house. I've got a fairly, fairly small house, which is sufficient for one person. I've got a car which gets me to my job. And the house I have in Tuscany is something that I was going to live in, and I bought it as a complete wreck. Yeah. So that's lovely. I don't. I don't, I really don't think that's a problem. I really don't. But I think that the constant kind of craving. It's this. Then I want this. Then I want this. Then I want this. And it's this searching which becomes the god. I, I want to know what your you understanding of adultery, adultery is, because my understanding may be different. Adultery <laughs> in the in the in the, in the uh, um, I suppose the dictionary term is um, when you have it off with somebody else's wife or husband. Mm. What if it's consensual? Doesn't because make... it's nothing to do with consensual, no, no. it's to do with the fact that you made vows towards somebody else. Yeah. Quite right. So you, it's marriage yes. rather than relate. So you could be having a relationship and doing that with somebody else, else and it wouldn't matter. Yeah. Because yes, you're not married, you... it's about the vows. You essentially know what adultery is. You know what committing adultery is, don't you? Because you just said it. I have very different ideas about what, this. What, what do you mean? I, I think adultery means when, when you deceive, when you deceive somebody, because I think deceit is a thing that actually damages, and I think that you can love more than one person. Right, so the, um, you had two husbands. Yeah, let's say you had two husbands. <laughs> and that, that is, um, I, don't, I, I, I can't give you the arguments about it, but I, to me it isn't quite on the cards. Mm. <laughs> it doesn't mean to say that you couldn't love them. Yeah. But if you love them in a, in, a, in a sexual way, for example, you've expressed your love through sex, then um, 
you you would be committing adultery. What have you lost? No, I, was, I was trying to find the, the commandments. Yeah. Right. I'm committing, you know, one of the ten commandments, an offence against the ten commandments, and going to that church. That finger is pointing at me. I don't believe you should ever lie to another person. I think that's what damages most relationships. But I do love somebody else, and Adam knows that, and is part of that family. That's what I call it. I mean, it's got its own challenges, and we don't really know quite what to do with it, but half of the bullshit is to do with those damn Ten Commandments. Hard as it'll be for the woman to adapt to convent life, it will be equally challenging for the nuns. Let us praise God who gathers us together. And us the heart of their home is close to the outside world. It's been that way for 700 years, making their community one big family. Keen to make the woman feel included, the nuns decide to reveal a bit about their own lives before taking their vows. The details of their backgrounds are news even to some of their sisters. Sister Claire Agnes didn't become a nun until she was 58. So I joined this companions club and met a chap called Frank. Well, he told me stories about how he'd been looking for somebody to, to marry ever since his wife died. And I was the stupidest woman ever was because I married him. And it really was. And I, I said, look, I don't love you. And he was just saying, you oh, no, I really love you and all this. And I didn't um, love him at all, but I married him. I don't know why I did it, but I did. Uh, I had a good party at my wedding, but that was about it. The reason why it was so disastrous is because he was a television addict. When he came home from work... <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, wow. He really was. He, he, when he came home from work at half past six, he had to have his meal at half past six, absolutely on the dot. After that, he'd sit down on, and he would, he would watch the television until it went off. The thing was, we never communicated. And this was the breakdown of it. He did a do-it-yourself divorce. He was very mean about money. He wouldn't spend money on his solicitor. <coughs> I could have contested every point of, of the thing, but I thought, what's the use? There was a sister in the school that used to ask that, which I now think appalling question, how many of the girls are going to be a nun? And there was this girl who always used to put her hand up, Sister Felicity became a nun 40 years ago, when she was just 18. I couldn't understand it because she used to leave school. She was a day girl like me, and she used to leave school with a different boy on his motorbike almost every day, and I, <laughs> I just couldn't understand it. And yet when she did it, there was something in me that would say, I wish I could put my hand up. God did come first. I mean, I was an RE teacher. Right? It was theology I studied at college and kind of... Sister Pat joined at 28 after being widowed. Uh, a friend was thinking that maybe God was calling her to join. By becoming a nun, they married God. As brides of Christ, they have had to separate from their families and friends and concentrate on monastic duties. I was brought up in a, a loving Catholic family, but um, my dad had very high expectations of me and he was absolutely, completely devastated, really. Uh -huh, that I was going to be a nun. And my mum was just heartbroken because she thought she was going to lose me altogether. Um, and she was fighting. It was terribly hard for her. Sister Gabriel was a 23-year-old university graduate when she joined 12 years ago. And my daughter wants to be a nun, but I don't want her to be a nun. And she had this raging battle inside her. Um, but she couldn't, I think at the time, she couldn't support me in it. Um, because she really felt that I was wasting my life at the time. And my father died when I was a novice. He was never really reconciled to me being a nun. 
and six weeks before he died, he came to the monastery. And to say it was the last thing I expected is the understatement. And um, we had a great chat. And then he went home and then he died. I, I don't look back, I'm very happy. Um, and and I'm, I'm really grateful that God's given me a vocation to be a poor Clare, and I'm especially grateful that he's brought me to Arundel. And I hope that the joy and, and happiness that I have, that you will ex I'm sure you will experience in some measure while you're here for the six weeks. just that they're so, they all just seem so good and I just think I'm so bad. I just feel awful. I just feel like so much bad coming out of me and they're all just so good. It just upsets me. I hope you've had a good day. Mm. Very good. It's only just one of many. You'll be better, you get better. <laughs> I hope so. So sleep well. Good night. Good night. Good night. The first day has given the group plenty to think about. Atheist Victoria is wondering how she's going to fit in. I'm not going to find permission to be me in the Bible. Uh, I'm not going to find permission to be me from these nuns. And just as I'm not going to find permission to be me from any other source, anywhere, other than my heart inside me, and until I can permit myself to be fully me and be that in the world, I'm always going to be seeking approval. Five in the morning. A mother of three Debbie is the first one up. She's missing her family. I don't want to do this without doing it properly. I've got to give it 100% because otherwise um, I'll have put Jamie through this because he, he'll be missing me now. Um, he will be feeling aware of the fact that mummy isn't there to pick him up from school. And I know he, in his little way it's painful for him and it will have been for nothing, absolute waste if I don't do this properly. So I have to do it 100%. He will snatch you from your tent and uproot you from the land of the living. The just shall see you to him. While Debbie is prepared to work to conform to the nun's life, the others are having difficulty with the rigor of the routine. Soul singer Iona has overslept, and Victoria has decided that today she's not going to turn up at all. There are still 37 days to go. Dear all, I respectfully request to be excused from attending this morning's prayer. I feel too overwhelmed at this stage and cannot let any more in just yet. My sincerest apologies and request for acceptance. In all love, Vic. She's not coming down till 2.15 because she needs some space alone, I think. Um, Which I understand, but it's like, yeah. we, you know, we could do with staying in bed a bit as well. I mean, yes. we, we've probably been brought yeah. up in a more rigid, atmosphere with rules and, and quite clearly I don't think Vic has so has she so I, she's probably not used to I, a routine I just feel terribly bad mannered if I didn't turn up for prayer I don't know I think that I just feel she's, really bad mannered by not doing that yeah but she's going through something in particular and I think that all right now she can see is, is kind of what she's going through
I just got so upset again. I mean, I've done all the pray prayers, which means if we're praying seven times a day, that means I've prayed 14 times in the last 48 hours, which is more than I've prayed in a church in my entire life. So, and I'm going in there and I'm doing it, and it, it's something's it's moving me, but I, I was just really angry. I was angry at uh, the nuns, and I couldn't be angry at the nuns because they're all really nice um, and they haven't done anything wrong. So then I realised I was angry. Well, I was angry at God, but then I can't be angry at God because I don't believe in God. Um, so then I realised I was angry at myself. We do live by a timetable, and if you don't adhere to it, you're actually disrupting our community. At the beginning, having no choice can be a difficulty. And part of even the living by the timetable is so that we're not scattered. And our whole life is built on this focusing. Mm. It's not focusing in order to ignore everything else, mm. but focusing in order to actually be able to see things more clearly. After lunch, Victoria decides to rejoin the group. Although her actions have upset the harmony of the house, she's not reproached. I mean, all the different things the nuns done, believe that anger surprised. prevents charity. My mother was a Methodist Sunday school teacher. My father was a very good swimmer. Um, he represented England in uh, swimming breaststroke. Um, and what was always important to our family was achievement. So it was natural that Myself and my brother were brought up in that way to try and win things, to achieve things. That's, that's what we did. Um, the nuns want to understand their guests better. The so the four women have been encouraged to explain their backgrounds and why they have come here. I started to muck about with kind of guys and, and um, went out, or not really went out with lots of boys, just kind of ended up being kissed by lots of them. And um, then decided actually you know, I was much better at kissing them, so <laughs> decided to do that much more than... And, uh, Iona is a soul singer from London, and at 25, the youngest woman in the convent. A reformed alcoholic, she found God three years ago and is now an evangelical Christian. I, I moved to London, with, moved in with my brother, and um, was drinking so much, the more and more painful stuff got, the more I could drink. Anyway, so one night I went to a big photographer's party. I was particularly shy then and didn't, didn't feel I fitted. Um, and so I drank a huge amount and I woke up in the morning and I just went, okay, Lord, I know you're there, but I can't heal myself. I tried to give up drinking so many times and I just didn't know how to do it. And, um, and I dragged myself to church and sat at the back upstairs and said, Lord, um, I'm not leaving until you heal me. And just sobbed and sobbed. And I felt this hand on my head. I mean, like this physical hand on my head. And I, it freaked the living daylights out of me. And there was nobody there. And I took this huge deep breath in. Um, and it felt like someone pulled out my spine. And I said again, Lord, take away my drinking. And uh, then I heard this internal voice kind of inside me say yes. And since then I kind of haven't smoked and haven't drunk and haven't even kissed a boy, which is weird. And it's been like four, four years and I'm here because I've felt God... <laughs> um, <laughs> ..call me to... Oh, I love that, do you love it when you can't quite speak? Um, ..call me to celibacy and... It's really, really, really hard, um, but really good. And I know that it's, it's, I know it's a blessing. It's just kind of got to kick in. <laughs> and I keep kind of praying that he'll, he'll take away kind of, <sighs> kind of the want to get married and the want for babies, you know, because that was kind of, has always been like such a huge aim in my life, you know, such kind of, a major one, you know, and I'm trying to live by it and trying not even to lick a boy, which is an absolute comedy for me. 
<laughs> Maybe not be kissing with them, but wow, have I done so in my head. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I'm, I'm just kind of trying to kind of get through that and really understand it and how you do it, you know, and also how on earth you do the no sex thing. I have no idea how you guys do that. That completely blows my mind, genuinely. I mean, <laughs> um, so yeah, so I've got like a million questions and, um, and yeah, it's really amazing being here and painful, but really, really good. Thank you for Thank that. You Thank you. Do you truly believe that? Do you truly believe that, that God, is, God is asking you to be single? Do you honestly believe that? Do you not think that this has been a, just your own process? You, you've processed this yourself. Why do, you, why do you refer everything to say, this must be God speaking to me? I know when I'm talking to myself and I'm kind of <laughs> <laughs> having having my inner battles and, and yeah. telling myself what to do and that kind of thing. But my relationship with God is where it's input coming from the outside, things I wouldn't think of ever. Mm. You know, Like you're saying, that that was so far from It was head. so so completely far from my head. And because I'm so tactile and because I'm so... Um, what's the correct here? word? I'm doing it. Sensual, aren't you? Sensual. You are. I mean, you are really sensual <laughs> as a person. <laughs> You like this sort of box of um, of chocolates, and you're the soft-scented strawberry one. You know, that's what you remind me of. <laughs> you're just you're the one that everybody really would go for. Everybody would pick like that, that chocolate. Cool. Everyone would have that chocolate. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. What decision is it? Is it now it's about whether it's a life decision or whether? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. kind of. Yeah. I, mean, I really struggle with my hormones really badly because I seem to be horny all the time. Um, so what do you do about that? Um, try very, very hard not to do anything about that. You don't do anything about it. You don't think this is I God's... do, but I try not to. Oh, I really try not to, because it's not helpful. Because it gets me in that state of mind, you know. And I really, yeah. really don't need that. Because it's, it's, all, it's such a selfish thing, you know. And for me, it's such a selfish thing. Yeah? Can I, can I just... Sorry. I think they need to slow down a bit. I think it's been a great culture shock. And I think, you know, Iona perhaps, you know, her feet have to sort of come down to earth. Uh, I get the idea, you know, that perhaps um, Jesus is great, um, which is fine, but somehow I feel that Iona has to quieten down and get in touch with that person. Yeah, I think it's all hoo hey and hurrah, and, um, and God can be like that sometimes, but for it to go much deeper, this I think she's got to slow down. The women have been here for five days, and convent life is beginning to suit them well, maybe too well. Some of them are starting to treat the nun's home more like a hotel. Continually turning up late for morning service. And in some cases, not turning up at all. They're even choosing which teaching sessions to be present at. It's gone for a walk. But I'm here and I found something in the right. Bible that is applicable right. to me. Perhaps I need to talk sometime about, you know, um, how we, if, you, if you're trying to think of fitting in with us, you know, we, we wouldn't do that kind of thing without some sort of... Um, Dispensating. Well, yes. That's it, I'm not spending any more money on foreign holidays. I'm just going to go to convent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to climb over the walls and escape in. <laughs> over the last few days, Victoria and Angela have regularly <laughs> snuck off together and become close friends, forming a clique to the exclusion of all others. This is something the poor Claire nuns don't do. For harmony, Friendship should be inclusive, not exclusive. I tell you what, I know this sounds incredibly strange, but you know if we could go to the pub every Friday night? You'd feel much better about it. I could live here. <laughs> yeah. I could. I could live this life if I could go over the wall to the pub on a Friday night. 
That wouldn't exactly be living this life, though, would it? <laughs> when they're going on about all their interpretations of things, mm. and this makes me think of this, and I think of that, and then I know I'm there, and I'm yeah, thinking, how do you get from A to Z? So well, you've been here a week, and they've been studying it for maybe, like, 50 years. I know, but I like to get... You're I like so to understand things quickly. You're so <laughs> outside about that, aren't you? <laughs> it's like the 100-minute Bible, on, that's me. One minute, you, one of these days, you're actually going to have to face this in yourself. <laughs> well, I want to do everything quickly. Yeah, and best. Yeah. It's like you want to understand the Bible better than the nuns do. <laughs> and you're really frustrated that you're not top of the class. <laughs> oh, God. I've uh, got your lighter. Oh. We can't eat the belts, can it? Oh, no, there was no belt. She's then. What are we going to say? The truth. We got into a very deep conversation about religion. No, because they'll watch it and see, won't they? <laughs> For now, the nuns will we bite their tongues about, about Victoria and Angela's friendship. But the guests' disobedience to the strict timetable is starting to be disruptive. The time after morning prayer. Sister Felicity tries to nip this behaviour in the bud. I have always understood that actions speak louder than words. It is no good, from my point of view, you saying nice things and saying we respect your life when actually your actions are not. Mm. You know, I'm very canny of words, particularly nice words, because they scare me. I suppose because I'm not a person who's good at doing nice talking. And when people do it, I tend not to believe them until I see it lived out. This is very sceptical, I know. But I think, you know, you come into this setting and we are willing and eager to do everything to make it possible for you. But you must be willing and eager to make it possible for us. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The nuns are convinced that exposure to their way of life will ultimately pay dividends. So Sister Pat tries to help them get to grips with what it really means to be a nun. The poor Clares are a contemplative order, which means they spend much of their day in prayer and meditation. To help the women reach this state of mind, they've been asked to visualize a passage from the Bible. They remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. In the hope that this will open up a dialogue with God. Don't let it be anything pressured. There's no need to talk to him all the time. But letting go doesn't come naturally to competitive, high-flyer Angela. So pause and wait for the other two disciples. Let them catch up. If the conversation you've been having with the Lord is one you want to return to later, we'll just tell him so. It was hopeless for me, I'm afraid. I couldn't get myself comfortable in the first 10 or 15 minutes, and I yeah. know that I've, you've got to get into it pretty quickly, because I'm thinking about the time all the time. I think, well, if I'm not into it by half past, I've only got about 20 minutes, and that's no good, because you need a lot more time than that. So I sort of gave up, and then I got really frustrated with myself for not having managed to do anything. <laughs> and I didn't, Christ, want, Christ. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't <laughs> want to upset you two, because I could see you were going for it. So I'm thinking, God, I need to move, and I'm, I really need to leave, but I better not leave, because that'll disturb everybody. And 
so then I started crying because I was so fed up with myself. <laughs> oh, God, what a shame. If we try and live how they live and do what they do and then take the space, etc., etc., then we'll, we've got the best chance of understanding everything and, and, and getting some sort of spiritual enlightenment. So if we're not doing the best we can do to do that. As far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm failing. And I'm not using the time well. We haven't got much time. I'm constrained by time again, aren't I? I think I'm still at work. I know that. I know, I know I've got to be less driven, maybe. Although this is an enclosed order, there is one area that is open to the public, the chapel. Every morning a public mass is held here. Who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his son. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say to one and I shall be For the nuns, this is the most important moment of the day, because they receive the body and blood of Christ body. in the form of communion from the priest. The body of Christ. A blessing is the closest a non-Catholic can come to this sacred moment, but it's something that two of the women have so far abstained from. Victoria, because she's an atheist. The body of Christ. And Debbie, the body of Christ. because she feels unworthy. When I was very young, my parents moved to Australia with my brother and myself. From what I can remember, it was from a child looking into their relationship, full of arguments and stress and fights. I knew something pretty bad was about to happen as young as I was. My mother packed our lives up in a suitcase and we had to choose who we wanted to stay with. We had to choose who we loved the most as a child. So I had to decide. And what I decided to do... Can I get a tissue? What I decided to do was um, follow my brother. So I made the painful choice. And all the time, I kept thinking that she would change her mind. You know, she would say, you know, if it means this, you know, we'll all stay together, we'll work something out. And I still believed that right up until we were boarding a boat. My father sent us down a, a gangplank um, to go and say goodbye to her. And she said that everything was going to be OK because she would see me in six weeks' time. So I thought that by the time we got back to England in that time, because she'd said she would see us in six weeks, that she would be there. And, uh, and she wasn't. So I counted six months and she didn't come. And I did six weeks after six months and she didn't come. And then I thought, maybe she meant six when I'm six years old and she didn't come. And then I thought maybe six weeks after six that she didn't come. And that went on until I got to seven. And I thought she's not coming ever. You've been pulling off the layers of the onions all this afternoon. It's come off and you're a bit more near the, nearer the center. Don't be frightened of it. Look forward to it, because it is a wonderful experience to come to know the real person that you are. And it, it takes a long time. Debbie's story strikes a chord in my heart, <laughs> because uh, nothing as bad as that, but uh, I had a dodgy childhood with mother, you know? I mean, my mother died. So I felt very much akin to her story. 
I just hope that these next weeks we'll be able to help her to find herself and to to be more peaceful about herself and that God loves her and and this should give her great confidence that you know she's not the rubbish that she thinks she is. After their initial resistance, all four women have tried hard to conform to the schedule, with mixed results. It's Iona, the only one with a confirmed faith, who is having the biggest religious struggle. I'm really independent. I really have problems being told what to do all of the time. And I'm trying, I'm really trying, I am, you know, to be a good girl to be I am the good girl and turning up to things. I'm turning up maybe a little bit late sometimes. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying, but I'm, I'm rubbish at this kind of thing. I really, I want to kind of buck, you know, and I want to be rebellious. sing in the services because my voice is too big. And so I'm kind of not able to worship in that way which is really frustrating because I'd love to let it rip to God. I think they're genuinely really want us all to find a bit of peace and happiness and that we have to find a way of doing that and my way at this moment is sitting on this tree trunk just listening to the birds and trying to work things out and trying to think if I'm ever going to work things out it can be a little bit oppressing in there sometimes and you just need to step back from it and hear what's going on in your own head I get on really well with the girls I like all the nuns I'm having a good time the problem with that is I'm going to face up, have to face up to the fact that the point is that I came here to explore my spirituality, think about what I've done with my life and where I'm going, and at the moment I'm not doing any of that. I'm so relaxed. I'm the most relaxed I can ever remember being. I'm having such a great time, and so I don't want to ruin it at the moment. I just want to enjoy myself. <laughs> Faith and religion, I would say, are different things. I was brought up atheist, and I think that's why I've always struggled to admit that I have a faith, because I can't align myself to saying I have a religion. Um, so I've always kept it quite secret. I've always thought that that was really lucky for people who've got religion, because they can just go, take it all away from me. I can't. I've got to live with it and find my best way of working with it. And I think that's probably true for a lot of people. And I think that there's religion just, I can't do it, but I want to. I want to do it in some ways. I want to be able to say, unburden me, take it all away, cradle me in your arms and make me feel better. <laughs> Debbie and Victoria are standing firm. For the last six days, they've resisted being blessed by the priest. But for one of them, that's about to change.
even laugh at me at home now. You didn't do anything wrong. You didn't take a solemn oath at birth never to do anything like that. You're wrong. Mm. It's not, I don't see all the words and things, but mm. I don't see anything wrong with it. Bless you. No, I'm just, just having a very big argument in my head with this. I mean, I think it's around here. If I start saying I hear this voice in my head, everybody's going to go, hey, you found God. <sighs> but I've always heard a voice in my head. And I've always listened to it. It's just I, can't, I find it really difficult to listen to it here because it's like, oh, if I do something like that, it's like, ah, oh, look, you know, she's finding the Lord, and I'm not. Nobody's my Lord. So what was it? Was it just a it's really loud voice in my head going, go, go stop being there. so stubborn. <laughs> You're so bloody stubborn. Oh, you are. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I hate everything that the rigmarole stands for. The hierarchy, it, it turns my stomach, the fact that it can only be a man at the front. And then there's all these really wonderful spiritual women, but they can't stand up there and do that. It can only be a man. It's like everything about it makes me feel sick. That's what's troubling me. Mm. Abide with me, fast for The women have been here just over a week. A good time to gather and discuss the impact the guests are having on the life of the community. I mean, just in the light of the week and thinking of this and how it affects us. When I was in the chapel um, on Tuesday evening, I came into the chapel to pray and um, there was Vicky and there was Angela and you were lying on the floor praying. So I came in to join you and then I got on my prayer stool and I said to the Lord, okay, what am I going to do? Because I don't think this is very respectful of you. And I was quite ready to go up and say, well, would you mind not lying on the floor? And the Lord said to me, I don't mind. <laughs> and I thought, what an invitation. That he would say, I don't mind. And I thought, well, if the Lord doesn't mind, what right have I? <laughs> But it was a real conversion moment. I mean, you know, we can love, and it's true, but you know, like, that invitation wouldn't happen if you weren't here. And it's such an adventure, and it's a great joy. I said to Sister Erin the other day, but, uh, you know how great, you know what a really good week it's been for me. And Erin said he will have to do it more often. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe once every two years, didn't you? <laughs> but we started off talking about all, all the styles. I said to Gable, isn't it marvellous? I said, all the different styles, something different every day. Oh, it's wonderful. She said, I'm that jealous. <laughs> One day it's the jeans and the boots, and the next day it's the long swelling skirts and the scarf and the hair. It's an eye opener for us. I want to find out what's how on earth people are celibates and how they do it and and I just need kind of guidance on that. And so kind you're of saying that you want to speak to somebody young or somebody old for that? Yeah, yeah. Somebody old? And, um, to give the women a more intimate understanding of religious life, Sister Angela, the abbess, has asked each one to choose a mentor from the community to act as their the confidant. I, I desperately want somebody to approve of me. In a sense, the person who has to approve of you is you. Yeah, which is what I realised. That, that, it that's... doesn't matter if nobody else does. Because of their early rapport, Debbie has already made her choice. The only thing that I have is an upset me, is an abandoned, hurt, mm. painful me. Sister Claire Agnes. I mean, when my mother left, mm -hmm. my mother was on the other side of the, the dock mm -hmm. that day we pulled away. Mm -hmm. I was just absolute blind panic. Mm -hmm. 
And all I could think about was how sorry I was, how, how I remembered praying actually then to a God and telling him how absolutely sorry I was that I'd made my mother leave, mm. you know, mm. and... Um, so you took, you took all the blame? Be, yeah. You didn't think that it might be something to do with your father? No. Each day, pick up any, everything positive that you possibly can to try to cancel out the negative things that are in your life because that's what's spoiling your life. That's what's keeping you captive, so to speak. Yeah. You were born into a, what we call a dysfunctional family. And so you were, the, as it were, a victim of the dysfunctional family, of the problems of your parents. It's not to do with you, Debbie. They put it into your head, and it's got into your, you know, into your gut now that you're this unworthy person. But it's not true. It's not true. I don't say you'll be totally free, but at least you'll have the the the, the, uh, the notion of how to to escape, to get free totally from the, the negativity that has dogged you from the very beginning of your life. And um, it's not your fault, it's other people's fault. You are not to blame. You are not this unworthy person that you've, you think that other people have told you you are or given you the impression that you are. The life that we have is lived in relationship and it's, it's kind of understood in relationship with each other in love. And it's not something you can sort of parcel up in a little bottle and say, well, drink two drops a day and you'll be a human being. You sort of fight the battle out. With 30 days still to go, will the nun's way of life really help these women find what they are looking for? Next week on The Convent. How many people had the opportunity to do this in their life? Angela's dedication starts to pay off. It's only week two and I'm already thinking, God, what am I going to do when it comes time to go? But the guests' disregard for house rules continues to test the nuns. I don't know what you've been doing upstairs in that little dormitory of yours up there, but we don't go into each other's rooms. Those rooms are private for each one of us. Bollocks, piss off. If you have been affected by any of the issues in tonight's programme and would like to talk to someone in confidence, please call the BBC Action Line on 08000 688 456. All calls are free and confidential. Lines are open every day from 7.30am until midnight.